Our guest today is president and CEO of the Chicago Zoological Society. The Zoological Society operates the world famous Brookfield Zoo, the most popular paid cultural attraction in the Midwest, serving over 2.3 million guests with an annual economic impact of over $160 million. His leadership has been key to developing award-winning partnerships, provi providing to urban communities of color, veterans, disabled, and other vulnerable populations. Our guest today earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Bates College, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Phi Beta Kappa. He earned his PhD in biology from the State University of New York at Albany. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stuart Straw. Stuart. <clears throat> Thank you all, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm here to celebrate in part uh, one of the longest running uh, public-private partnerships, certainly in Illinois, and that's the partnership we have with the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Um, and I've got the new logo, uh, I think. So, uh, so Arnold, uh, and I should mention, by the way, that our board chair, John Gruby, is here from uh, As well as our senior statesman uh, board chair, our board deputy chair, among other things. Uh, wait, hang on a second. Uh, say, Jerry Mann, thank you very much, boy. Yeah. So, yeah, I have a I have a BA in biology, uh, just like uh, one of our high functioning autistic uh, people who works with us. Uh, who has a BA in biology from Southern Illinois, and I said, physics, and he said, exactly. So, Jerry, if I forget a few things, I know Art Fogel is also here uh, from Northern Trust Bank. And Zena Diggs, do I see Zena? Okay, so I'll move on to the meat of the batting order. This. Uh, this partnership started somewhere way back when, when people thought about having a big huge zoo out in the suburbs like uh, other places do in major cities. And so the Forest Preserves were founded in 1914, just had the centennial a few years ago. Uh, in 1919, Edith Rockefeller McCormick, uh, I suppose you could add Ford to that and have a better last, two last names, but uh, uh, Edith Rockefeller McCormick uh, decided to donate uh, property, uh, but specifically she spent a lot of time in Europe and wanted to have a zoo that was big like European zoos, had barless exhibits with moats and was a modern zoo in every respect. Uh, in fact, she donated the, the property. It took a couple of years to uh, accept the donation because uh, one of the stipulations was that um, uh, it would revert back to her if a major zoo were not opened uh, 15 years after it was accepted. So. Uh, we came in under the wire. Uh, in 1920, uh, the Forest Preserves developed a zoological garden committee, uh, and the zoological garden committee visited zoos all over the country uh, and said, and one in Canada, and said, well, you know, we found the right model, but the right model requires a public-private partnership because uh, uh, there was a famous quote by Peter Reinberg about that, but I won't talk about that. I will say that the Chicago Zoological Society was very much formed by leadership uh, a private side leadership in the uh, uh, in Chicago land, uh, and its governing members uh, numbered uh, many, many, several hundred, uh, and they still do. And governing member ambassadors are very important for us. So uh, that private sector partnership was ratified by the state legislature uh, in 1923, uh, and the Forest Preserve owns owns our property and owns our buildings and uh, we own the animals and operate the zoo. Uh, that's basically the way it goes. Uh, and that partnership has been going uh, strong ever since. And it's been stronger under Tony Preckwinkle and Arnold Randall and Eileen Fiegel's leadership uh, in, this, in these last few years as we celebrate centennials of a whole bunch of things that we did together. Uh, so uh, 1923, on the second try, uh, the a bond initiative, a referendum was passed. Uh, and in 1934, the Chicago Zoological Park 
uh, which became very quickly, since we had advertised Chicago Zoological Park and everybody could go to Lincoln Park Zoo, the new zoo at Brookfield, which became the Brookfield Zoo, talk about a confused brand, uh, was open. So we started out, you know, down here at the bottom is the menagerie. Nobody is a menagerie in zoos anymore. The zoological park, the idea of ecological things and habitats of animals, biology, cooperative species management, professional development was sort of the idea of zoological park back then. Uh, my predecessor, late Dr. George Rabb, president emeritus, who served us for 60 years in various functions, uh, passed away a few weeks, uh, about a month ago, but um, uh, he took it to the next level, environmental theme, ecosystems, survival of species, holistic conservation, organizational networks, and, emergent, uh, and, and uh, immersion exhibits. Uh, back in our first strategic plan in 2004, we said, well, we want to get a little bit farther to be a conservation leadership center where we talk more about ecosystem health, the role of humans and nature, uh, the idea of how that connections, how they are formed, and and sort of do a lot more with conservation psychology, a field that Dr. Rabbit founded, engaging people, visualizing success, uh, and the idea of interactive exhibits, uh, knowing that we were in the age of millennials. Um, uh, so over the years, uh, Brookfield Zoo grew from uh, the first year was about 1.5 million to 2 million in 1938, when we were the first zoo in the world to have pandas. Uh, declined during the war years, but then Dr. Rabb brought this up to a solid two million guests. And we are now in this decade into the two point, we're gonna be a little over 2.2 uh, averaging, uh, sometimes over 2.3. Uh, and I'll tell you how we did that later. So we have the usual complement of guests. These are Bactrian camels, native to Gobi Desert in that area. So high deserts uh, in, the, uh, in uh, Asia. Uh, of course, Western lowland gorillas. Um, this is a silverback who always seems to have an attitude, but they, they are generally just like any other guy on Saturdays watching, <laughs> eating brows and uh, uh, we also have pinnipeds, uh, quite a few. Uh, that exhibit has been with us for some time. Uh, and of course, we're the first inland zoo to have a dolphinarium in 1961. Uh, that dolphinarium is now expanded uh, and, and uh, in another part of the park, much larger. And going along with that, we have a 47-year study of wild dolphins in Sarasota Bay, which was a baseline for this whole Deepwater Horizon uh, uh, impact on, along the coastline. Uh, and we have some unusual critters. Uh, everybody knows what this is, right? Yeah, mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> if you shaved your anteater and rolled it in guitar picks uh, after spraying it, it would be a pangolin. These are one of the most endangered groups of, their CITES one, uh, which means highly endangered, uh, and they're, they're considered a delicacy uh, in Asia and also their, their scales, in addition to having at one time served as guitar picks, are also, uh, are also considered medicinal. Um, and um, water buck and, uh, and orangs. Uh, a curacao. I was a specialist group director of a curis. never mind. Uh, these are uh, these are highly and highly threatened group of birds down in South America. Uh, white pelicans rescued from the Gulf a few years back, and so you know we have these questions. Everybody has questions about zoos. Um, I'm a field biologist running a zoo, so if anybody's going to have questions about zoos, it's going to be me. Uh, so animals. Some say, Stuart, that animals are better off in the wild than zoos, and I'm sure a lot of us would agree if habitats were in great shape and if, uh, if there were no threats that animals would be better off in the wild than in zoos. Uh, at face value, that's absolutely true. On the other hand, um, one of the things you saw in that earlier, that earlier uh, slide about caring about animal welfare uh, one of the things that we have really focused on is the science of animal welfare, uh, animal care and welfare, uh, and under professional circumstances. So uh, next week we have our third international symposium in that regard. We bring in people from all over. So uh, Humane Society of the United States will be there, 
uh, uh, Performing Animal Welfare Society and a few others from the, uh, from the not so sure about animals in captivity or under professional care. And then there'll be people from uh, science programs all over the world, uh, university as well as zoological as well as others. Uh, and we've published quite widely in this area. Um, we also worked with this group, American Humane, American Humane Association, the parent group of uh, the Humane Society of the United States. They split up back in the 50s, um, and they are the ones who certify uh, things to be humane, humane safe, that no animals were killed during the making of this movie or harmed during the making of this movie, uh, unlike the 1960s. And uh, they also uh, thought they'd wander in and say, oh yeah, we'll come in and see if your animals are okay. Well, wait a minute now, you know, there's 5,000 animals and 500 species. How are you gonna do that? So pick the ones that are most likely to be found uh, difficult to uh, have under professional care. So we worked out with them. It's a scientific program. It's head by an animal ethicist, well known by the animal rights community or animal protection community. Um, and they, we're the first zoo in the galaxy to be certified humane. We're one of about 70 now and growing with that program. So um, we also have an incredible uh, team of uh, veterinarians and they integrate very well with our keepers and they do work in the field. So for instance, up on the upper left here, you'll see we have a large bore CT scanner that was donated by a combination of Amita Health and Toshiba. Um, and uh, it's not exactly top of the line because uh, we get the you know, cast offs, but they're good for us. Uh, and we, before that, we were taking our dolphins to Loyola to do a CT scan, which was really exciting going through the, going through the emergency room. Uh, <laughs> So we also have uh, dedicated uh, Dr. Satya Chilandurai. This is uh, Marina Ivanchik, who's, the, who's our radiologist. She's now doing work internationally, online, uh, working with other zoos in Aquaria that don't have, usually, they, if you take, a, you take a, uh, a radiology of your zebra and you give it to a horse doctor, it's not the same as giving it to a zoo doctor. So uh, that's going on also, anesthesiology with um, uh, Dr. Satya Shinandurai over here. Uh, Mike Atkinson, our director of clinical medicine. This is the first ever uh, uh, dolphin uh, born with a veterinary assist, which was about 10 years ago, uh, and doing quite well. Uh, also, we work in the field. So we have programs uh, like this 47-year program of bottlenose dolphins, where they have over 3,000 dolphins in their database, and I can identify them with digital photography now and the necks and notches and their dorsal fins, uh, programs in the field in, in Peru. Uh, also, this person here who is, uh, who is actually saying hi to Giraffe here, but she works uh, in elephants, uh, elephants for Africa down in, uh, down in uh, Botswana. And this guy up here, whoa, I'll get this straight, uh, the Department of Dyslexia. Uh, Dr. Bob Lacey, who is the author of the, uh, the programs that track genetic management and demographic management of wildlife under professional care, as well as uh, risk of extinction, uh, the, a very complex model in the field that's been in use now for about four, 30 years, and uh, he's updating that right now. So people say animals should be, are better off in the wild and not under professional care. So this is animals in the wild. This is the, the total weight of land mammals uh, in the world. Uh, the black dots are humans. The gray around here is livestock, and the green is wildlife. So in terms of overall weight, less than 7% of the world's, world's mammals are wildlife. 31% are humans and 62% are, are livestock. Which means that in the wild, humans, livestock, and wildlife are always in conflict, one way or the other. We, we are blessed with this huge country that's sparsely populated by comparison to places like Rwanda. And, uh, but I can tell you that if that's, this dot right here is all the elephants in the world. Uh, I can tell you that other places it's not the same. So, 
elephants, for instance. Market hunting, uh, there were three million African elephants or more uh, back at the turn of the last century. Uh, today, there are about 500,000. And you can see that Indian elephants have gone down from 100,000 to uh, about 40,000, uh, largely poaching for ivory. Um, and that's a major concern <coughs> worldwide. Giraffes are the fastest disappearing large mammal in Africa for bushmeat. You can see in conflict zones like over here and on the borders with Chad and, and Sudan and with Somalia, uh, those populations are at risk. But even in the outskirts of Nairobi, uh, people can chase down, chase giraffes for a while until they tire out uh, and then harvest them and bring them into market. Rhinos, last week we had a, one of the success stories in rhino conservation coming out of, of Zimbabwe, where a man whose uh, first language was uh, Shangan, who uh, was originally born in Rhodesia, uh, uh, a white non-Hispanic landowner who linked tribes and landowners together in an incredible program uh, for conservation. and as, grown the rhino populations in private and public reserves that are linked there. But around the world, the misconceptions about rhino, what rhino horn will do for you. Should I say it? Well, I mean, now that we have Viagra and, and you know, and, and all that stuff, <laughs> let's just put it in the water, okay? So, um, and polar bears up north, uh, shrinking sea ice, as you know, uh, and frogs internationally. Dr. Rab was the champion for amphibian uh, decline. So uh, with all that angst, you know, uh, hey, it's like this, right? Uh, everybody know what this river was? Come on. Come on. Cuyahoga River, thank you. Cuyahoga River in uh, Burning back in the late 50s, early 60s. I do that every once in a while. I had a friend who grew up in, in, uh, in Cleveland. He'd go down and throw a cherry bomb out on the water to watch the fire go rippling out from all the hydrocarbons there. It's now an American Heritage River and a wild and scenic river. There is hope. So here's some species. California condor. 30 years ago, everybody was, everybody was saying, no, the condor, let, let it have death with dignity and not take it under professional care, largely in San Diego Zoological Park, and breed it and have it reintroduced now all the way down uh, through western Mexico up into the states. That's in the Grand Canyon. Uh, this species, uh, golden lion tamarind, we participated in uh, in bringing that back to the Atlantic Coast forests of Florida, or sorry, <laughs> Brazil. Um, where the Brazilians, uh, Florida is where the Brazilians own the, all the orange crops. Uh, this, is, um, this is the American bison. Now the national mammal. Everybody knows the American bison is a national mammal? Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Our logo. That's why. Um, uh, so a national mammal brought back from just a few hundred uh, Arabian oryx, the Mexican gray wolf. Uh, which we're very active breeding uh, and actually have done a trans uh, a cross fostering where we took wild animals, wild pups from the wild and put pups spread at the zoo into the wild successfully. Uh, if you want to fight elephants, 96elephants.org because 96 a, a day were being killed. Uh, this group of people along with uh, one of our George B. Rabb Conservation Medal winners, Ian Douglas Hamilton, have gotten people like uh, Yao Ming, the Chinese basketball player, and Li Bingbing, who is apparently known to hundreds and hundreds of millions of Chinese, but not very many Americans, uh, to be celebrity spokespeople in China. A lot of success, more to do. Okay, here's another one. Hey, Stuart, I hear that zoos are about entertainment, not education. No, we're not about entertainment. No, no, we are not about it. We're not, do not have a good time. You come to the zoo to be educated and that's it. No smiling, no laughing, no fun with a family. It's a great business model. I don't know how many of you are practicing it at work, uh, but 
zoos are about more than just entertainment. 90% uh, of the science knowledge that we learn in America, uh, by the way, Brazil has twice the percentage of Americans that understand global climate change is caused by CO2 and is caused by global warming, or caused by, by um, greenhouse gases and as human anthropomorphic, anthropogenic in uh, origin, um, we choose not to believe. That's the difference between science and political science. Uh, so education, 90% of STEM education comes in post-secondary school in this country. The majority of that comes from science museums, URA, anybody from MSI, just a shout out, uh, zoos like us in Lincoln Park, and aquariums like uh, the Shedd Aquarium. So, this is how you do it. No, that's not how you do it, but it, it looks good, doesn't it? You know, I, oh, that'll be in my scrapbook. I'm having a little chat with, uh, with the kids with the face painting saying, why don't you have your face painted? Why are you sitting there? Okay, uh, I started out working in South America, and, uh, and what you quickly find out when you're working in South America, you're working in Zimbabwe, and you're working in, in all over Latin America, uh, all over Africa, Asia, it's about people. Conservation is not just about birds, bugs, bunnies, native habitat, and all that stuff. It's about people and getting them engaged to the point where they want to support that, because it's good for you to have unstructured nature play and there are several books on that, uh, and how if you have too much structured play outdoors, um, it may, and, you know, it does something bad. No, the good part is going out and seeing animals. So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of things, and you tell me the first thing, if you are sitting up close and personal with that, the first word that comes to your mouth, your mouth, your mind, like is it, hey, is it? Oh, is it? Ah! Okay, just let's try those, okay? How about this one? Ron, yeah. That was 20 feet behind me, who was in the back of the Land Rover. Um, how about this one? Uh, beautiful, king of the beast. I'm sure glad there's glass between me and him. Okay, how about this one? That's kind of cool. You can make up a, fam a family story. Are we sharing? Can we eat now? How about this one? Baby giraffe. Ooh, boy. Now we're getting kind of, okay. Here's the next one. Okay, here's another one. Yeah, thankfully I only took one of those. So, uh, and then we left quickly. So, so, the, um, so the question is, when, when you see those animals, you have an emotion of some kind, right? How many of you have a dog? Yeah? How many have a ferret? See? So, uh, dogs are more personable than ferrets. Uh, so, uh, how many of you have a dog that when you come home is just jumping around and just all excited to see you, mostly because you're gonna get the food, they're going to get the food. But when you come home and you have a bad day and you sit down, you have a dog that jumps up on your lap and looks at you like, was it really that bad? Can we play now? Can I lick your plate? So, so what's going on there is you are, you are connecting with the animal. Humans have an innate, there's another one. Uh, that's a good one too. They have an innate connection with animals. And when, you're, when you experience the animal up close and personal, you have, your endorphins are pumping. So serotonin and uh, oxytocin are pumping out of your brain and go, attaching to all those receptors for, uh, for opioids, basically. That's why most uh, antidepressants are serotonin uptake inhibitors. It keeps serotonin from being metabolized. So you have more, so it bonds more to the back of you. Oh, I feel so good today. Anyway, so... Uh, so that's a natural reaction. We work a lot with kids with uh, autism spectrum uh, issues. And autism spectrum has a variety of different unknown causes, but one of the symptoms is having fewer opioid receptors in the brain. When we see kids with autism spectrum and they're working in a clinical trial with some of the healthcare groups we have worked with, you see them become focused, the agitation is gone, 
and they're looking, making eye contact. It's like that. So you have families that are crying and the kids having a good time in our Hamill family play zoo. See, even I do it. I was having a bad day until I saw Hudson. Um, so why is all that important? 196 million Americans go to accredited zoos every year, by, accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquaria. Uh, that's more than all our other cultural institutions combined. I'd like to say that that's because everybody is perfect, but it's because of people's connections with nature and the unresolved connections that you have with wildlife. So, kids get that every day at the zoo. This, by the way, this young lady here uh, is Z. She's been on the front page of uh, the Tribune also, uh, uh, having cognitive function uh, a difference. And she, her first two words to her mom were at the Brookfield Zoo. She pointed the tiger and said, cat mommy, when she was eight. She's now introduced, she's introduced uh, Governor Quinn. She's learned how to read and write so that she, can, she could give a presentation at our World Black Tie Gala. And she's a seasonal at our Hamill Family Play Zoo. So, the zoo is there for everybody. Everybody should be coming to the zoo because if you don't, you don't have that bond with animals. Your endorphins will not kick in as much. And by the way, pay full freight. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just... <laughs> okay, so um, conservation is also diverse. I mean, we have everybody from all walks of life coming to the zoo. Uh, it's, it is a, and we're living in uh, a, uh, an era where 87 per, whoops, 87 percent of Americans live in urban, area, urban areas. And where do you think the greatest voting block is coming from? Ah, urban areas. So most of those 196 million people who go to zoos come from highly urbanized areas. So one of our goals is to make, I worked in Florida, where you can see this is from the Audubon blimp back when I worked with them. Uh, this is a group down in Florida uh, who was out, a group of kids from, uh, from Overtown uh, who were out birding. Uh, why this fastest outdoor sport, growing outdoor sport. Um, and there is this fascination with wildlife if you give kids a chance. Now I'm a, I was at the first Earth Day at Wave Hill in 1970. It's really exciting. I was two, no, I was a gamete. Anyway, um, there's just two things that we advertise. One is this is a zoo for all. This is Gigi. Gigi also presented to our world. She's a naturalist guide, uh, and she can't speak. She speaks through an iPad. Uh, she was down at the AZA conference uh, giving a talk and meeting people as well. This young lady here is celebrating Earth Day. This is our conservation uh, outreach program, uh, strategic plan, in, in Fuller Park, uh, which is not a good place to grow up. And her Earth Day message is clean up after yourselves and do not killing people. <laughs> That's a little different. I did a, an interview with Politico about uh, should the environmental community get more diverse? Well, yeah, you'd understand some of these things more. Um, so what we do in our areas of interest here is we do a lot of outreach. Zoo Adventure Passport is for kids on the west side, south side. Uh, early childhood done in, uh, uh, performed and has been performed for now 30 years in uh, public libraries. Uh, family signed contracts. We have kids who have graduated from that and gone to our middle school programs, gone to our King Conservation Scholars Program, got scholarships to college or graduating from Yale and Notre Dame and all over the place. A lot of them, the first kids and their family are in generations to go to college. Uh, if you go through that career ladder pathway all the way through King Conservation Scholars, this group, young naturalist here, 65% uh, kids of color from urban areas. Uh, the rest are from uh, suburban areas. So you have an ethnic, socioeconomic, and much more diverse and motivating 
uh, in, in many ways a uh, group of people. And they all work together. They don't get in just little bands from, I'm from this place, I'm from that place. It's homogeneous. Um, Zoo for All is for kids with, uh, who have various differences. Uh, so we have part of our camp here, also part of King Conservation Scholars, also part of this, uh, is for kids with various uh, differences. Um, with a BA in biology, I know about that. So uh, over here we have education programs that go out into the community. Those are not our program animals, but we do have program animals, as you can see, and various other things that do go out to the community as well. So I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to get this straightened around, but you know, every once in a while we do measure the declining proportion of our guests uh, that are white non-Hispanic. So as you can see, between 2006 and 2016, we went from, among our members, uh, went from 63%, went from, sorry, 78% uh, white non-Hispanic to 63%. So in other words, there's 37% here that are people of color. Um, our non-members, though, have gone from 60% down to 40%. Uh, so that means there are about 60% uh, people of color. So how the heck did we do that? Well, first off, we worked with county commissioners. Uh, and county commissioners can target community-based organizations. They're on the board of the forest preserves. Uh, and we reach out uh, through them to needy folk. Secondly, we work with community-based organizations and we give out a pile of free passes. So that 200,000 increase in attendance is by and large people who otherwise would not be coming to the zoo. Uh, we can almost guarantee that. We also have free passes you can check out of every library um, in the region if you can find them because they're quite popular. Uh, so, oh, this is, uh, this is hiring, 25% that's the other way around. It went from 25% uh, people of color up to 46% were targeting around the same, uh, around the same this year. So, program animal, a tamandua, also known as a hairy anteater, arboreal anteater. Uh, we have a red-tailed hawk up here, uh, even mud. Unstructured play, remember, mud, my favorite when I was a child, uh, can be part of that, and interaction directly with, uh, with animals. So we focus on all these things, and the Hamill Family Play Zoo is great unstructured playtime. Uh, if you have young kids or young grandkids, please come out and we'll show you a great time. So in, uh, in summary, vital statistics, 5,000 animals representing 500 species. Humane certified by the American Humane Association, the first of many. International leader in the science of animal welfare. Annual visitation about 2.3 million. 500,000 <coughs> guests visit free each year. 250,000 of those are school children from 2,000 schools. International leader in conservation education. We have a 15 year uh, regional economic impact. These last 15 years have been about 2 billion and nearly 80% of our budget is from private sources. But, so in other words, so in other words, we raise a lot of money to get this stuff done. It's not all taxpayers' funds. Uh, and we dearly love the 20% gang from the Forest Preserve. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> big shout out. Um, uh, and also, uh, bring your family and friends. And thank you very much for your patience. Okay. Um, so we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we're going to get a couple of in, a couple of in here um, as soon as we get some. I just want you to know, Dr. Stroll, you are hilarious and fun. And had Mr. Wilbur, my eighth grade science teacher, been this much fun, I might have, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Randall, I'm still not that thing, whatever you call it, Zorbin or Orbin, but I do go to Brookfield Zoo. Uh, but yeah, you're a lot of fun. Anybody else a science teacher this much fun? I had one that was really fun. Clearly you did because, yeah. you know, you went into. Um, so I'm going to get right to these questions. Sarah says, Wingy? 
Is that you? Sarah Is that you? I never even knew her last name. I was like, that has to be her. because Okay, so she's a City Club staff member. Yay. If we've not touched upon the subject, could you please go into detail about your organization's partnerships with, could you talk about your partnerships with schools, specifically several schools, and educating them about wildlife in particular? Sure. Um, I forgot about that. That's the second part of my slideshow. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, actually, we have uh, quite, a good, uh, quite a few partnerships. There's uh, traditional school field trips, but those are becoming more difficult to find funding for. Uh, but now that people are testing for science in Illinois, we probably will get a little bit more. Uh, but we also have programs that are in school systems uh, working with teachers. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of teachers uh, who are teaching science subjects, especially elementary uh, and middle school, uh, don't have a lot of training or uh, certification in science topics. So. Uh, what we do, we have a program that keeps changing its name because our donor uh, keeps funding it for new cycles and needs to have a different name, perhaps to give its board, we're not sure. And, uh, and that program was called Levels of Engagement. So you can go in and work with teachers who are at a certain level. And this is all in failing, well, challenge schools, let's put it that way. Uh, and all in the inner city. And it's, uh, so if you, if you just want to do curriculum and learn how to do curriculum, we can do that. If you want to get more comfortable with curriculum and get training in that, you can do that. Uh, that progresses up to in-service credits. And if you want to get a master's in science inquiry or master's in science education or zoology, uh, we have that program that works through a number of different uh, universities, but largely University of Miami at Ohio, and it's online. Stephanie Leash Emrich, are you still here? Absolutely. <laughs> and you are a member, great, so I can't give you a hard time about that. Um, she's from Service Speak Solutions. Congratulations on your Tuesday, Thursday free days. And what was the impetus behind making that happen? Um, well, <coughs> oh, I had to think a second. <coughs> we are required by law to have 52 free days, uh, but what we've done beyond that is do kids free days in the summer. Uh, so the Tuesday, Thursdays, and then weekends in uh, January, February. I got that right, Rich, right? Yeah, and weekends, January, February, see? Uh, how about March, maybe? Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so those are, those are uh, we exceed the number of free days. Um, but we want to make it so that uh, focus on kids and families with uh, who otherwise wouldn't come. And so that's why we have all these other free pass programs and everything else. Uh, the Forest Preserve has been supportive in, in, uh, in with buses from the end uh, on weekends in the season uh, from the end of the CT, uh, CTA lines, uh, which has helped some. I think we need to publicize more in the communities as well. I'm sure that we could stay here another 15 minutes listening to Dr. Strahl because why not, right? I'm, can, I, can I come to your desk like the kids that got their face painted? Yeah, sure. I can't, I'm not getting my face Absolutely. painted, though. Absolutely. Yeah, you could. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'd paint it. And then, you, okay, well, you then maybe. Paint my face, too. Okay, then maybe. Yeah. I'm telling you, if Dr. Wilbur, Mr. Wilbur had been this much fun, I think I'm going to have to go home and tell him that Dr. Straw is pretty cool. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I think that this is great that we at City Club take the opportunity to talk about these types of things because who honestly has been to Brookfield Zoo this year? I have. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, me too. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can clap for him. Oh.